This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on SNN Network. And joining me today is Brian Lewis. He is the president and CEO of IntelliCheck. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is IDN on NASDAQ. Brian, welcome back. Great to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Robert. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. So as I said, it's great to have you back on. And uh, we're going to jump right in. We're going for it. Uh, we, we last had you on the program about a year ago. So can you describe how the last six months have been for IntelliCheck? Yeah, I think the last six months have been a real validation of all the changes that we've really put in place since I started, you know, now just a little bit over two years ago. Uh, and we continue to sign clients. So I think the last time we talked, we just had a handful. Now we've got many of them. Just to give you an idea, um, in December, we signed our first non-US based lender, a Canadian lender in 5,000 retail locations. In January, we signed one of the largest credit card providers out there with no brick and mortar stores. Everything they do is person not present. In uh, Q1, we signed a Midwest bank with 1,100 locations. Uh, in, also in Q1, we brought live in March actually, a uh, healthcare provider, uh, loans for uh, elective surgeries. And, you know, we just recently announced that we signed yet another Midwest bank with over 1,200 locations. So, yeah, I think it just continues to show that fraud is not going away. And, you know, banks and lenders are, are protecting themselves and their clients. So we're actually recording this on Tuesday, June 23rd. And the company actually just announced literally today uh, a prominent financial institution adopting your authentication technology. Uh, to safeguard customers and prevent fraud. Can you explain a little bit about that and how that's kind of been part of the narrative of what you just spoke about? Yeah, so one of the things that we saw in the fraud world last year was that account takeover, where they come in and completely take over your account uh, and kind of wipe you out. The, the fraudsters learn that if they can get control of an account, it's generally more lucrative than trying to go into a store and get credit, you know, and walk out with some merchandise. They're really getting cold, hard cash. So Javelin said that fraud, account takeover fraud went up or like uh, 94% uh, uh, TransUnion said the fraud went up 347%. So between the two of them, there's something to be said, that's the right number. Now, what the banks are doing is they wanna make sure that somebody isn't coming in or coming through the call center uh, and saying that they are you and now taking over your account and moving all the money out. So this particular bank and many others are now, if you want to do things like change your address over the phone, come in and clean the account out, wire out money, those types of things, they're going to make you authenticate yourself so they know it's not a fraudster. Got it. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I really enjoy doing interviews with companies where they have a new customer acquisition, they're, gaining lots of customers, but the always the main question that I get from my audience and other investors that watch some of our interviews is they want to understand, okay, that's great. They're bringing on new customers, but let's understand the economics of this. What does this mean? You know, how does it work? Mm -hmm. can, can, you, can you explain a little bit about that? So what we do is our pricing model. I think one of the things that's really driven some of the revenue growth is we changed it from this static per store model. Uh, where I felt that we were not getting the value for what we were bringing. Because every single time there's an interaction, there's a chance for that to be a fraudulent transaction. So I moved us to a model where every single time they need to authenticate somebody, we get paid. And, and that's really driven some of our revenue growth. Uh, you know, right after we spoke last time, we took one of our clients, a large credit card issuer, and moved them from the old model to the new. And in the first quarter that they were in that new model, revenues increased 75%. Uh, we also did a renewal with one of the retailers that uh, used to be on the old model. We increased their revenue, their, their fees 56%. So I think it shows very much that we have pricing power because our clients know what we're doing for them and how much we're saving. So from our end of it, we look at things in terms of how much your scan volume is going to be. Uh, you know, for us, you know, we, we look to bring on our, you know, our clients to especially, you know, the big box stores with high scan volumes, because that's where most of the fraud occurs. So, you know, our model is based on, you know, two things, signing banks, and then they put us in all sorts of locations in their banks. 
you know, everything from, again, their call centers, their uh, bank branches, uh, automotive loan divisions, uh, and then obviously at the retailers where they're issuing credit cards. So every time we see, you know, or we announce that we brought somebody on board uh, or a new retailer came live, that, that means there's, you know, an expected revenue increase. And once we announce that they're live, it's pretty much near immediate. It's not like a retailer rolls it out across their stores. They bring it out generally in a big bang. Got it. So COVID-19 pandemic has affected us all one way or another. I have to ask, yeah. how, how has the pandemic impacted IntelliCheck? Uh, yeah, certainly it brought foot traffic down. So that had an impact on revenues when we were looking at uh, at, the, at the numbers and what we saw happening in our last earnings call, we gave guidance that we expected to reach about 60% of SaaS revenue in Q2 that we had in Q1. Not total revenue, but SaaS revenue. Uh, you know, and the reason for that is, you know, I think a lot of people thought that as soon as stores closed, our revenue would be zero, but that certainly wasn't the case. We do a healthy online person not present business where our clients are authenticating people, you know, over the phone or they're applying for credit on a website. Uh, many of our stores were considered essential services, so they remained open. So uh, retail, uh, retailers that sell electronics, uh, office supply goods, you know, stores that sell everything from tires to groceries, they remained open. And our model is that the banks pay us minimums. Right? And then what we do is we charge them per scan. So between all of that, we figured we would come in around 60%. Uh, you know, the good thing is we're also seeing now as stores open up, you know, volumes of scans are increasing. You know, it's, you know, obviously it takes, it's slower than, you know, if they don't open up immediately because everything is first opening up for curbside pickup. But even that curbside picket is, pickup has brought us new business because some of our clients are realizing that it was so much easier to now use stolen credit cards. Uh, we had a furniture retailer, 40 store location that uh, people were using stolen credit card numbers, calling the store. Now, if the store manually enters in the credit card number and it's stolen, they eat the fraud. It was killing them because nobody's running that EMV chip at a curbside pickup. So they called us up and you immediately implemented, we've got a product that's just web-based, no implementation. So as soon as they took the order, they would say, what's your mobile phone number? Send a text to the person. They click the text, opens up their camera, scan the license. We prove whether or not they're a crook immediately and their fraud disappeared. So, you know, although it, it hurt, you know, certainly in, in the short-term revenues, I think it made people realize they had re rather large holes in terms of their online fraud protection. And I think it's brought a renewed interest for our tools there. Got it. So recently the company also announced that it's set to join the Russell 3000 and the Russell 2000 indexes. What does this mean for the company? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, it makes us really proud. Um, I think that it also shows that the street, uh, believes in what we're doing. You know, we wouldn't be there if we hadn't grown, you know, in both revenue and share price. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, when I announced it to the to all the employees at the company, you know, virtually, uh, everybody was like, wow, you know, what a difference from where this company was two years ago, you know, when we were trading, you know, below $2. Uh, and now people recognizing what we do and how uniquely we do it and what that value proposition means. And the company also just announced a, a proposed stock offering where the company stated that it, uh, and I quote, intends to use the net proceeds from this proposed offering for general corporate purposes and working capital, end quote. Can you provide a little more insight here? Uh, yeah, a couple things. You know, it, it seemed prudent at the time uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, there is certainly uncertainty out there, uh, you know, about what might happen in the fall. And many of our clients, you know, they're, you know, international banks, very large organizations who are now betting a very large chunk of their, you know, anti-fraud, identity theft uh, processes on us. And, you know, Bill White, my CFO, was very good at explaining, no, you can trust us with, you know, three, four million dollars in cash. 
uh, I think that they feel much more comfortable knowing that we've got a much stronger balance sheet sheet. So it seemed like a very good time uh, to, you know, bolster the balance sheet. And then also use some of that capital, I think, for growing our brand awareness. You know, we are certainly a leader in what we do. Uh, you know, I always go back to the New York State DMV before they gave our product to their law enforcement officers, running a thousand fakes against our system, and we caught every single one of them. We've got a track record out there that a lot of people don't know about, and I want to make sure they know that. And we also have a very strong competitive moat in, you know, especially this on-prem retail space where most of this happens because we're the only product out there that does not require new hardware. Whereas many of our competitors who authenticate a license through templating the front of the license, all the retailers would have to buy new hardware. And it's not cheap, you know, and if you take some of these big box retailers with, you know, 11, 1200 locations and 25 point of sale stations each, you know, and now you say it's gonna cost $250 for an optical scanner, they're just not gonna pay it. So that provides us you know, a very strong competitive moat and, and a competitive advantage in, in bringing in new sales. That was just gonna be my next question is, is I mean, I, I'm sure there's been such a, a surge for wanting to see more fraud protection out there, especially right, you know, there's times where I go, I go to the market and I'm like, all right, how are they going to check an ID to see that I'm, you know, that, I mean, hopefully I look overage at this point, but like, I, I, you know, even, right. for, even yeah. for that. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I also say it's unfortunate that many of the retailers, you know, some of the big chains who were worried about um, selling uh, products to underage people, they confuse scanning with authentication. And often what they're doing is scanning. It just means they're parsing the data and it appears right. And they're happy. It, it just, it doesn't mean that it's a real ID. Uh, you know, the FDA put out a product that they wanted to give to all uh, people selling vaping products. And you could download it for free. I did. I stopped at 250 fake IDs and it still hadn't caught one. So it's a really, you know, there's a big difference between authentication and scanning. And part of what we do is educate people to that so they realize that, oh, wait a minute, I thought I was doing something good, but I'm not. You know, and we're certainly seeing a big, you know, again, I think this COVID, you know, and the, everybody at home made people realize, again, I've got to worry about now just not in store and on prem, which is why now we can do everything for our clients from just a simple scan of a license, the back of the license, all the way through to facial recognition to make sure that, you know, step one is your license reel, that plastic reel, and then step two am I still holding it, you know, or did I, you know, I go stole, you know, a friend's or, you know, my grandparents or something, somebody's license and I'm committing fraud. I mean, at the end of the day, retailers prior come to you like, look, we just don't want there to be any lag in the journey, right? Like, yeah. yeah. I, I mean that, so as long as you have a product where it's what an extra second or two, I mean, that's, that's, that's the real game changer, right? Yeah, and one of the things that the retailers love is it is a second or two for us to authenticate and send back the data to populate the application. Because, you know, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, I get asked all the time, hey, do you want to open a credit card account and say 5% today? And then you say, yes. And they say, okay, well, go over there and fill out this form. I'm like, nope. Uh, what we do is, at, you know, once we authenticate the license, we streamline the process so that we automatically fill out the application for them. And all the applicant has to do is enter in social security number and, you know, maybe uh, income. You know, I've done this at several of our retailers just to, you know, walk through their process. And generally, I get the credit popping out of the machine before they put my merchandise in the bag. So generally, from start to finish, you know, we're talking 30 seconds or less most of that being the crediting decision at the bank. So from what you can tell us, what would you say are the one to two things that investors should look for now moving forward? Um, you know, I'm going to say, you know, certainly, uh, you know, more information about, um, uh, you know, new clients that we're bringing on. You know, we've, we've publicly stated that one of our banks uh, is looking to bring, they've got, you know, on schedule, a large uh, big box home improvement store coming uh, live in September. 
you know, the one thing that we didn't miss a beat on with COVID was implementations and all the work that goes on with that. You know, we've been a company that's always been able to work 100% remotely. It's just been an important thing to me. I work downtown in 9-11. I want to make sure we can do that. Uh, and so, you know, we all went home that weekend not knowing we weren't going back to work, but we didn't miss a beat. And thankfully, many of our clients didn't either, and their IT departments could work remotely. So all of the meetings about implementations and everything to get them going, you know, they, they continued as though nothing had happened. So you know, that makes me excited because our pipeline and what we were planning on, you know, for our own internal revenue projections, you know, hasn't really changed. So with that, where can my audience go and find everything they need to know about IntelliCheck? Uh, definitely IntelliCheck.com, uh, our website. Uh, there's a lot of information under the news, and, and that's another thing we should point out. We just recently rebranded all of that new logo, new colors, um, and I think much easier to navigate. And if they'd like to see what we've been saying in the Investor Center, they can see our latest investor presentation, which says a lot about you know, what we changed, uh, how that works, our wins, and I think where we're going. And that's IntelliCheck.com? IntelliCheck.com. Perfect. All right. Well, Brian, thank you as always. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this with us today. And uh, stay safe. Good luck. I look forward to our next update. Thanks, Robert. It was really good talking to you again. Thank you.